Okay, in the last lesson, we talked about how uh, the other European powers, uh, mainly uh, England, France, and the Netherlands, has started to explore North America. You know, they're looking for, to get rich. They're looking for land, wealth, and power. And they're looking for that fabled all-water route to Asia, the fabled Northwest Passage. All right? Today, we're really going to concentrate more on England and its colonies. But the first thing we need to talk about is England's very, very first attempt at... Uh, settling in North America, establishing a permanent colony, all right? So now it's, you know, like 1585, and some people have been watching Spain for almost 100 years, getting wealthy. And some of these gentlemen go to Queen Elizabeth and say, hey, listen, let's go over and put up a permanent colony in North America. We'll get rich, okay? So Sir Walter Riley, he raises some money, and uh, he takes about 100 men, and he sails out across uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, they land at an island called Roanoke, all right? It's right off of North Carolina, okay? However, you know, after about a year, they begin to run short of uh, supplies. They begin to run short of food, water. Uh, they're also having some trouble with their, their neighbors, which are the Native Americans. Um, and then, you know, they decide to, you know, pack it up, all right? We're leaving. You know, this is too hard. So they leave. But in 1587... Walter Raleigh sends another guy named John White out. Uh, he was one of the actual original colonists who had, um, who had gone on the original trip to Roanoke. He gets out with a new group of settlers. You know, this time they have women with them and children. Um, and again, they begin to run low on supplies. So um, John White, he returns to England. He says, hey, listen, guys, I'll be back. Don't worry. You know, stay here. I'll be back in a couple months, right? So he leaves about 117 colonists behind. So he takes off and he heads back to England. When he gets to England, though, guess what? They're at war with Spain. And he can't return. Like, nope, nope, we need you here. So it's going to be three years, guys. Not three months. Three years. Now, can you imagine these 117 colonists back in Roanoke? You know, it's three months, any day, you know, they're looking. Six months, a year, 18 months, two years. You know, he doesn't return. They Maybe they thought he was, uh, maybe his ship sank. Who knows? Maybe he's never coming back. Maybe he tricked them. They don't know. Okay? So finally, though, White goes, I got to get back to those people. So he returns. He arrives to the settlement of Roanoke. And it is empty. No one's there. All right? Houses stood empty. Vines have been growing up through the windows. Um, nobody's there. There's no bodies. There's no skeletons. It's just vanished. All right? So they started looking around. And on a tree, someone has carved into the tree the word, Croaton. Croton is the name of a nearby island, okay? But other than that, there is no other trace of the colonies, right? Now, why was Eger, you know, he's like, well, let's go find them. But then a storm begins to blow up. Uh, the crew uh, kind of refuses to cooperate. They refuse to make the trip. And guess what? To this day, nobody knows. Nobody knows what happens to the lost colony of Roanoke. Now, there's some speculation that uh, they went to, or maybe the natives felt pity, brought them in, because there are stories um, from the Croton Indians that, you know, there'd be uh, uh, children that were born with uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, which is not, you know, part of their natural DNA. Uh, some people think that maybe they were killed by the Indians. Some people think, I think more likely, they probably went and joined up with the local native tribes just to survive. But nobody knows for sure. So the lost colony of Roanoke is a disaster. All right? So it's going to be about 20 years later. 20 years goes by before England begin, begins to try to uh, create another colony in North America. So in 1606, uh, by the way, Queen Elizabeth is dead now. And the new king is King James I. All right? And he has the Virginia Company which is kind of a private company in London, but who has an official charter, official license from the king to go and uh, establish a colony 
in the New World. Okay, so you know the Royal Charter gives the Virginia Company the same right to settle the land between North Carolina and the Potomac River. The Charter also, you know, had guaranteed those those colonists who chose to come along the land. Okay, um, and it promised them they're going to have the same rights as English citizens back in England. Well, so in the spring of 1607, they take off. They take 105 colonists, all men, all right, and they sail on the Chesapeake Bay, and they begin to build homes along the James River. And guys, it couldn't have been a worse location, all right? Terrible location. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for gold. They're looking for gold. They're not looking to, in fact, I don't think, I think most of those guys really, their intention was to go get rich and get back to England, the good life. You know, North America didn't have museums and parks and fancy restaurants. Now they're probably over there thinking, hey, I'm going to get a lot of, remember these, if I didn't tell you this before, most of these guys are gentlemen, okay, rich guys, all right? So let me leave you there. Uh, so, you know, we talked about the lost island of Roanoke or the lost colony of Roanoke in the beginning of a Jamestown in 1607. Okay, so let's look at the uh, geographic area. All right, so here's the Chesapeake Bay. Here's the James River right through here. You can see this, right? It goes all the way up to here. All right, so they decide to build Jamestown right there. Do you see that? Now, if you notice that it's kind of a darker blue right there. So let's look at our legend. This is the legend of our map, okay? And it says fresh salt transition zone. So all this water down here is salt. This water up here is fresh. But this area right here is what's called brackish. Half salt, half fresh, all right? Jamestown, gosh, they could not pick the worst place. I mean, this isn't a swamp. It's a swamp, all right? And the water isn't good to drink, all right? If they'd gone up a little further, they'd probably been better off, but they don't. They build their, um, their first colony right there in a really terrible, terrible location. Okay, here, so here's a map of kind of what their fortifications look like. It's more like a triangle. They had some... Uh, turrets or, you know, some sort of little defensive areas right there. They built up this kind of log stockade in a triangle, triangle, and then they put some crudely built houses and tents in the middle. Now, Jamestown actually had a, um, a council of about 13 guys that they had decided who's going to, you know, run the colony. But these guys bicker and fight all the time. They don't get along. Um, and by 1608, uh, it is a disaster. It's a disaster. People are starving to death. People are dying of bad water from mosquito-borne um, diseases. It is uh, it is not good at all. All right? So there you go. Now let's get to the uh, challenges at Jamestown. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this first of all. Okay. Number one, they build Jamestown in a swamp. Terrible idea. It has very bad water, lots of mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes carry malaria. They get very sick. Many of them die. I told you they have 13 guys who are kind of in charge of it. So you got this quarrelsome ruling council, and they fail to make plans. And the people begin to starve. You know why? Because colonists search for gold and wouldn't work. You know, they're like, hey, we need to plant some corn. No way, man. I'm going to go out for looking for gold. Well, how about you? Go get some, dig a well. No way, man. I'm looking for gold. Well, who's going to chop some wood down for fires? I don't know who you're going to get, but I'm not doing it because I'm getting gold. So you see, these guys are not interested in working. And again, I want to, I want to also emphasize that many of these people that are there are what is called the gentry or the gentleman class. They're not used to working. They've never worked. Usually they're the second, third sons. You know, they're coming over here to the new world because they think they're just going to jump off the boat and they're going to pick up gold like they're picking you know picking up rocks well guess what guys there's no gold there all right they have very very poor relations with the natives and this all leads to massive starvation all right now on the brink of this disaster we have a guy kind of step forth his name is john smith 
Oh, I guess we'll get to John Smith in a minute. All right. So hey, let me, I mean, I kind of I kind of jumped ahead of myself. But anyways, so the guys come over on three ships, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. And again, they want a gold, silver riches. And they're, again, they're looking for that fabled all water route to the Pacific Ocean called the Northwest Passage, which does not exist. 105 settlers, half of them are gentlemen. Remember, these guys are the gentry class, not used to working. And these people are far from self-sufficient. Um, if you think about it, if you've never worked, I mean, you don't have any skills. You don't know how to build a house. You don't know how to dig a well. You don't know how to um, mend equipment that breaks. These guys are very, they don't know how to plant crops. Terrible group to send over to start a colony, okay? So they're very far from self-sufficient. Okay, now we'll talk about John Smith. All right, now John Smith is a guy who kind of steps up uh, and basically saves the colony, okay? So John Smith, you know, he kind of a, um, he's a young guy. He's a soldier. He's an explorer. And he looks around and says, I cannot believe this. I mean, all these guys want to do day in and day out is search for gold. They don't want to plant. They don't want to, you know, plan for the future. All they want to do is search for the gold. All right. So Smith really, he, he's the guy that really saves his colony. He sets up these very stern rules that force colonists to work. They go, listen, if you want to eat, then you must work. If you do not work, you will not eat. Wow. He also goes and visits you know, some of the native uh, Indians in there. Uh, he meets with Powhatan, uh, Powhatan, which is the most uh, important chief of that area. And uh, the, the natives agree to supply corn to the English. All right, they probably looked at these guys and go, "Oh my God, look at these people, man! They are they're starving, they're dying. We got to do something to help these people." So, the tribe decides to, um, you know, give them some food, give them some food. All right, but these peaceful relations are not going to last very long. Um, basically, they end up just eating up all the food instead of using it as kind of a bridge. Uh, to get them from where they are to where they need to be, they just eat the food. They continue not to work and plant crops. So guess what happens? The natives say, well, forget it. We're not going to give you any more food. All right? So what do the colonists do? The colonists used force. They go there with their guns, and they seize the food from the natives. In fact, once even John Smith himself raised a gun at po Pohat Pohatan's brother, you know, you know, I'm going to shoot you unless you guys give us some corn. All right. So incidents like that are obviously are going to lead to bloody reprisals, warfare between the tribes. It looks really bad. Um, you know, but something else happens. Something overcomes all that hatred, and that is love. That's right, love, because one of the colonists named John Rolfe falls in love with Powhatan's daughter. Pocahontas. Yeah, baby, Pocahontas. Okay? So for a time, there's, you know, you know, there's peace. By the way, I should tell you about Pocahontas. Pocahontas was probably a very young woman. Um, she, uh, you know, falls in love. They take her back, actually, to England. And the people of England are like, oh, my God, this is so, she's exotic. She's from the New World. We love her so much. They dress her up in all these fine clothes. They take lots of pictures. She's the toast of the town. But guess what they have done? They have taken a young girl who has no immunity to European diseases, and they stick her in probably one of the filthiest, dirtiest towns in all of Europe, London. And guess what happens? Well, of course, she becomes ill and she dies. In fact, she's buried in England. All right. All right. Um, Let's get back to John Smith. Now, John Smith, again, was the huge help with the natives. You know, he kind of negotiated some of that treaty. John Smith also is a guy who says, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your dad was. I don't care he was the Duke of Earl or whatever. You're going to work if you're going to eat. So he has no respect for social classes. And I'm sure a lot of these guys are, well, sir, you must not know who I am. He goes, I don't care who you are. You're going to work. You're going to plant crops. You're going to work. Or you're not going to eat. So many of the colonists are like, we don't like this guy. We want him gone. Ew, he's mean. He doesn't know who I am. I'm a big, important guy. Let's get him out of here. So John Smith goes back to England in 1609. 
And then a lot of those, you know, care, guess what happens? It all falls back into chaos again. And a lot of those people are like, hmm, we wish John Smith was back. We really did like him, right? But they don't realize his worth, of course, until he is gone. The colony falls into uh, disrepair and decay. They begin to um, eat their dogs and cats, snakes, toadstools, which you can't eat because it's poisonous. Um, they even broke up their houses, chopped their houses down for warmth. And I'm telling you, it's on the verge of collapse. Everybody's going to die. And then um, a ship arrives. A ship arrives and they look at these guys and go, oh my God, these guys are... Oh, this is awful. Everybody get on ship. We'll take you back to England. They're getting ready to leave. And believe it or not, guys, another fleet arrives from England with more colonists and more supplies. If they had left the day before, you know, who knows what would have happened. All right. But now Jamestown is able to hang on by the skin of its teeth. All right. But let's find out what really made Jamestown successful. You know, I should probably look at my slides before I start going into all this stuff, huh? All right, well, here's Pocahontas again. Uh, she was 11 years old when Smith was in Virginia in 1607, all right? 1614, so she's, you know, 18 years old, married John Rolfe, had a son. 1616, went to England, of course. And here's the pictures of her in England. She's kind of dressed up like, you know, the ladies of England. But again, she dies on March 21st, 1617. So only a year when she catches all these European diseases and dies. Pocahontas. But because of her relationship with John, John uh, Rolfe, uh, they do have a, a time of peaceful relations with the, the natives in that area. All right, I guess we need to also talk about the uh, kind of the legal documents that gave you know, the Virginia Company its legal rights. All right, now the King of England, James I, you know, gave the Virginia Company a charter. A charter is a legal document they gave the company certain rights, okay? And this goes all the way back, guys, to King John and the Magna Carta. The Great Charter of 1215 said that the king could not raise taxes without consulting a great council of leaders, mostly his noblemen, all right? So for the first time in history, the king has to consult others before he just raises taxes, all right? This begins to uh, evolve into the parliament that we know of, Okay? Um, that represented other people, and they make the laws, okay? So you can see that the Virginia Charter actually kind of comes from the Parliament, which goes back to the Magna Carta. So you start to see some legal traditions that are carried over from Great Britain into the New World. All right, so uh, this is the beginning of Virginia's tradition of representative government. Uh, we haven't talked about this, but I'm going to give you a little... Um, you know, heads up now. America is a republic. We're not a democracy, we're a republic. We have representatives. We elect people to represent us at uh, the local, state, and national level. All right? And this goes all the way back to this time. So, the Virginia Company reforms in 1619. The governor would now consult settlers before he made decisions. Male settlers and there was quite a few of them by 1619, would elect people to represent them, and these guys were called Burgesses. Okay, these Burgesses would represent the people of the colony. The Burgesses would meet in an assembly called the House of Burgesses, usually like in a church or maybe um, a city hall of some sort, probably not a city because they didn't have a city, more than likely the church. Okay, they'd meet there, and they would make the laws that everybody would have to obey. Everybody didn't get to vote on it, all right? They're not asking everybody to vote for these. What they have done is they have elected people to represent them, the Burgesses, okay? Today, um, do you vote on every single law that, you know, your parents wouldn't have time to go to every city council meeting, every meeting at the in Lincoln for our state, or to Washington, D.C. to vote? We don't have time. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws and bills, you know, so what we do is we elect people to represent us at the local, state, and federal level. Okay? And this is what they did beginning in 1619 in Virginia. Okay. Now i got to tell you what saved, um, what saved Jamestown. All right. Guys, it is a vile and nasty product. 
One that uh, we talk about all the time. One that kills millions of people a year. This product saves Jamestown. And that product is tobacco. That's right. Tobacco. Um, the colonists had learned to grow tobacco from the natives. Um, and, uh, you know, tobacco has nicotine. Nicotine is highly addictive. And they ship this stuff back to, to Europe, to England. In fact, King James I says that it is... And by the way, the tobacco then was used mostly for pipes. You know, they don't roll cigarettes or anything like that. They chop this stuff up, stuff it in their pipes, light it, smoke it. And it is the rage. Everybody becomes addicted and they can't get enough of this stuff. King James I calls it a vile, you know, custom. But still, you know, this addiction to tobacco... Um, catches, you know, uh, fire, for a better term, all through England, and the people can't get enough of it. And by 1620, England was importing more than 30,000 pounds of tobacco a year. And now they have an ability to make money. And tobacco is the thing that honestly, really, honestly, saves this colony. There is no gold there. They're living in a swamp. Um, it's not really much good for anything else, but they can grow tobacco there, and tobacco is the cash crop that they need to be successful. Okay, remember I told you that most of these dudes in the uh, Jamestown were guys, all right? So can you imagine how nasty that place probably was? You know, you get a bunch of guys together, they're not, yeah, man, they're flinging their underpants against the wall, they're, you know, they're not taking showers or brushing their teeth, they're just being nasty, right? So, um... You know, the first woman was actually there in 1608. She was kind of a maid, but very few other women followed until 1619. All right, in 1619, they realized that, hey, we need women. We, if we want to grow this colony, we're going to have to have kids and we're going to have to have families. So in 1619, <coughs> excuse me, the Virginia Company sends over about 100 women to the colonies. But now the Virginia Company isn't doing this because they're a super nice company and you know really care so much about it. They're going to make money on this. In fact, um, the men quickly found wise, but guess what? They have to pay the Virginia Company 150 pounds of tobacco for, for their wives, all right? Which, of course, they sold. Now, women's lives were very, very difficult. Um, uh, you know, they're kind of, though, they're maybe not out in the tobacco fields, but, you know, they're baking the bread, they're grinding the corn, they're mending clothes. It's very, very difficult work. We cannot even begin to imagine how difficult women's lives were back in this time. Um, there's no stopping at McDonald's on the way home. There's not going to the store to pick up a loaf of bread. Everything that they have to wear or eat, they got to make from scratch. All right? So women had a very, very difficult time. All right? Um, by 1624, there's still less than 300 women in Jamestown, but again, the company begins to, uh, begins to build. All right. Now they still need though, more workers. They need more workers. So in, um, you know, 1620, I think it is, uh, yeah, I think 1619 or 1620, I think 16, I, I, 1619, let's say that. A Dutch ship arrives bringing 20 Africans with them to work the fields, all right? Now, the colonists really kind of value these Africans because um, they have a lot of agricultural skills. These Africans back in West Africa are growing crops, and they're pretty good. Um, some of these Africans are going to be enslaved for life, but others are actually are allowed to be free. And for a time, they even had the ability to vote. Uh, but this is going to be um, short-lived. Uh, by the, you know, toward the end of the 1600s, you're going to find that uh, uh, African Americans are going to be enslaved for life. By the early 1700s, free African property owners could not even vote. All right. So you see, unfortunately, by 1620, 1619, 1620, the slave trade that was so prominent in Central and South America begins to creep into North America. And in 16... 19, uh, the slave trade begins to work its way into the English colony at Jamestown. All right, so there you go. As we've talked about today, we've talked about the lost island of Roanoke. 
Um, we've talked about um, Jamestown and some of its early struggles. Um, what saved Jamestown? It was tobacco, believe it or not, tobacco. And um, we also talk about how that beginning of representative government uh, begins to show up in the New World, as well, unfortunately, as the slave trade. All right, so there you have it. Hope you enjoyed it.